the heart of drama in any movie is a reversal, basically. You think something's gone one way and suddenly everything changes. I really, I spend, I spend this, uh, the first big chunk of time just working in little notebooks and all I do is I draw like arcs and split them out into like sequences. I need to basically be able to see the whole plot in my head before I can sit down and actually start writing. You shouldn't write dialogue until until your you, until your characters in your head are literally bursting with words. You should your problem should be that keeping up with the words as you're typing. The notion of like look over here while you're actually you know slipping a card in their pocket or setting something else up here. The way that usually works the best is when it's emotional misdirection. You know that you've pulled off a great plot twist when it feels satisfying beyond just oh, that reaction, when you actually feel like people are happy that it has happened. After it's done, it feels like it was inevitable, even though they didn't see it coming. The heart of drama in any movie is a reversal, basically. You think something's gone one way and suddenly everything changes. A plot twist is just something in a movie that is a big hinge moment that you don't see coming. And I think it's not effective when it feels like it comes out of nowhere and is disconnected from what came before it. Whereas if it feels like the culmination of something or if it's a surprise, but it's a surprise and it connects up with things from earlier in the movie, then it feels satisfying to an audience. You shouldn't write dialogue until until your you, you until your characters in your head are literally bursting with words you should your problem should be that keeping up with the words as you're typing and for me the way that that happens is it's the very last step of the process that structure is is not just kind of mechanical story structure it's character motivation what you're really doing with structure is figuring out whose perspective you're talking from what each of these characters wants in each one of these scenes and how that's gotten us through it. So that when you sit down to write the words, you know in every specific scene what each character wants in that scene. And that then is, is gives you kind of that foundation and then you can just let them talk in your head. Then you can just become a crazy person and let these voices out. And and in terms of like the specific voices and how they talk and everything, it's, I. I yeah, again, I don't know, just for, for me, it's it's nothing less crazy than just literally letting them talk and transcribing it. You just kind of have to create create them in your head, and then when their voice sounds right, you kind of know it. But I wasn't just thinking of the cityscape, I'm thinking of just the entire, tonally, it's a very complicated the aesthetic idea, of the whole thing, yeah, yeah. And you keep it just to the point where it's going to confuse the audience, and they, right. but enough so they can figure it out. Well, that, yeah, I mean, that's just storytelling. That's, yeah, that's absolutely... Uh, I mean, I wanted it to, you know, and anytime you're dealing with time travel, you're mixing a really complicated thing into the, into the soup. And so much of your work as a writer ends up going into taming that element of it. And especially with this movie, because it was, I didn't want it to be a puzzle movie. I didn't want it to be something where the audience felt like they were doing algebra homework watching it. I wanted them to, I wanted it to be a ride, not a puzzle. And also I wanted it to get to a very emotional place at the end. So um, it was important that the time travel did its job and then kind of took a back seat and let these characters deal with the situation. Um, so yeah, that was something that, I mean, a lot of the elbow grease in the writing went into trying to pull that off. There's obviously, um, behind it, the ghost of Agatha Christie. Why, why particularly that now? Well, I've been an Agatha Christie fan since I was a kid. Uh, I've been reading her books all my life, and I'm a big fan of the um, of all whodunit movies, but particularly for me, the ones where Peter Ustinov played Poirot, which were in the kind of late 70s, early 80s. The sweet spot was Death on the Nile and uh, Evil Under the Sun. Yeah. And um, that kind of all-star cast and not a comedy, not a parody, like a straightforward mystery, but with a sense of slightly cheeky, self-aware fun. Uh, and then, yeah, the notion of really genuinely taking a whodunit and trying to plug it into 2019, um, not just by giving it kind of a modern skin and putting cell phones in it, but doing kind of trying to do what Agatha Christie did with her characters, which were... Um, you know, they seem like kind of dusty old tropes today, the, all of her character types, like the, you know, gruff old colonel and the butler. And, but when she was writing, those were, she was drawing kind of 
you know, elevated kind of caricature-like versions of types who were very present in her contemporary society. And the idea of doing that today, um, doing a whodunit where we do the same thing and kind of draw these big, larger-than-life characters, but for maybe some people that we'd recognize a little more in, in 2019, for, show, be, for show. better and for worse. I like the relationship between telling a story on the screen and a card trick. I'm always really interested by that analogy because there there are a lot of similar elements that are at play, and one of the big ones is is misdirection. The notion of, like, look over here while you're actually, you know, slipping a card in their pocket or setting something else up here. The way that usually works the best is when it's emotional misdirection. Basically when you're guiding the audience emotionally to feel a certain way. And that's going to bias them to looking at things from a certain angle. While the thing that you're actually setting up is in the other direction. That's always, I think, the most effective thing. Inglorious Bastards, you don't think of really as a plot twist movie, but maybe the number one example of a thing that happened at the end of a movie that I didn't expect, where I felt as if I was floating off of my seat in the theater with the realization of, oh my god, this is what this movie is doing. The fact that we know it's a, here's a gang that's gonna try and kill Hitler movie. And so from the very start, all of our expectations, emotional and otherwise, are tuned towards tragedy. Because no one's gonna kill Hitler. We know they're not. And so these guys are gonna fail. Because of that, that's the ultimate misdirection. So at the end of it, when you're waiting for it all to go, go wrong, and it does all start going wrong, it happens. And they win. And I remember when I realized I was watching a fantasy, I remember that having the emotional effect on me that I think is the ultimate thing that any plot twist could ever aim for, which is a feeling of revelation. You feel like the floodgates have opened in your heart and like, oh my god, this is what this is actually doing. And that for me exemplifies the emotional reaction that the best plot twist can give you. Some advice on screenwriting. Um, I, I mean, I think it's one thing that I kind of want to start doing more of is, is getting a hold of scripts for movies that I love and reading them, reading the original script. And it's really important to track down, if you can, the shooting script as opposed to one that's been conformed to the movie because you're going to learn a lot from just hearing the writer's voice, seeing how the writer engages the reader on the page, um, and seeing how they pull you through the narrative. The other thing, though, I, that I always find really helpful is to do the exact opposite as well, is to look at a movie that you love and I actually, I put like the counter on when I'm watching it, I'll sit with a notepad and mark down when the major events happen in time and kind of diagram out the film. And it's really fascinating with some of your favorite films, if you do that, it's almost like opening the back of a watch. You kind of suddenly see, you see through the matrix and you can kind of see structurally how the thing ticks and why all the things happen when they happen. Um, very structural things to do, but it, it's one element that I, that I find really useful. Like, I'm curious, so on day one, you're sitting down to write this thing. How much do you know the entire arc? How much are you, can you sort of talk about, because it's, it's all about figuring out where to give information, and there's yeah. so many little things. Yeah, well, I, with, I mean, with, with every script I've written, and with this one in particular, I write really structurally. I, I have to start... Um, I really, I spend, I spend this, uh, the first big chunk of time just working in little notebooks and all I do is I draw like arcs and split them out into like sequences. I need to basically be able to see the whole plot in my head before I can sit down and actually start writing or I'll get lost in the weeds. Um, so I plan and plan and plan and plan and this was um, like that only more so. This was even more crucial for me to have the whole thing mapped out. But then you actually <clears throat> get into it, and as you guys who are writers, you know, you get into it, and no matter how much you plan, you know, it's, it's like you, you plan out your map through the forest, looking at like the map on, in your cozy living room, and then you get in there, and you're actually hacking through the forest, and you figure out stuff doesn't work, and you figure out new paths, and um, so yeah, it's kind of a mixture, I guess. You know that you've pulled off a great plot twist when it feels satisfying beyond just, oh, that reaction, when you actually feel like people are happy that it has happened. After it's done, it feels like it was inevitable, even though they didn't see it coming. That's some heavy duty conjecture. Plot twists in my movies, again, I try and make it so that they're never really the point. Like with Knives Out, for example, it has a revelation at the end in terms of a whodunit style revelation. For me, 
it's much more about the relationship that has to the character of Marta's arc throughout the story and how you're going to react to the very last shot of the movie, basically. To me, that's kind of the actual twist that I'm doing with the audience is where she ends up at the end of the film in relation to the family. Yeah, and similar with Brick, like I mentioned, there's the plot twist of, oh, it was actually the femme fatale the whole time, but the real plot twist for me is what she tells him at the very end that completely shifts your emotional perspective. The stuff I'm always going for and trying to give people an experience of is kind of an emotional revelation as opposed to, um, you know, a true plot twist. I don't know, is it gonna sound, does it sound like something you put on like an inspirational poster or something, but you do just have to find, you, you gotta just make, you gotta find your voice and follow it. You get, you gotta, and that sounds like so cheeseball and completely just in the clouds, but the, the reality is it is also the most practical and useful advice that I can imagine because the most precious commodity, if you wanna use that word in the industry is a unique, talented voice. And as much as there is reason to be cynical about the industry and about it's, it's how tough it is and all the sharks in it and all the motivations, the reality is if you got something to say and you can say it well, people will, it's not necessarily that you'll like, I don't know, nothing's guaranteed or whatever, but that is something that everybody is looking for. It's something that sounds very kind of high in the sky, but it, it is actually the best advice is don't think strategically in terms of how do I break in, just focus inward, focus on what do I have to say? How do I care most about saying it? And then do the work and get it out there any way you can. And then I had the script, I had this very weird script and I had no connections at all in Hollywood. I had very few social skills. And so it, I had no idea how to go about getting it made. And so basically what I did was just try to get the script to literally anybody who would who would read it, you know. And for, I mean, forget agents, managers, producers. I'm talking like anybody who would who would read it, essentially, you know. But I guess what I'm saying is, though, you it's you can't be too selective and you can't be too precious in terms of you can't and you. Can, I don't think it's even that useful to try and like think out and target. Okay, this person, that person. I think it really the shotgun approach is what what worked for us because the truth is, you never know who you're gonna give it to, who might like it, and who might give it to who, who might give it to who, who might give it to who. There's no way to predict like the chain reaction that's gonna get it to someone who will actually be useful. Um, so, I mean, if your neighbor's willing to read it, give it to your neighbor, because who knows who your neighbor knows, <laughs> you know? it's. Uh...